Hello and welcome to Cafés Transatlánticos. This is our Coffee Talks series to celebrate the cultural bridges that connect both countries, Spain and the US. We have several ones and this time we have uh, the honor and pleasure of having Andres Jaque and Michael Wan. Uh, the good thing of these conversations is that it's an it's, it's a on ongoing conversation that they've, they've been having for a long time because uh, Andres is uh, an architect, a writer, and a curator. Michael Juan is an artist. Andres is from Spain. Michael from both, they're both living in Europe, but my, my, uh, Andres is from Spain. Um, I said that this uh, conversation has been already going on because they've been participating in, in the Shanghai uh, Biennale. Michael was there with, um, with a piece uh, called Body, Bodies of Water and in Manifesta 12, in Palermo with his piece, uh, The Planetary Garden. And bo in both events, Andres has served as chief curator in the first and co-curator in the second one. So uh, uh, the good thing, as I said, is that they've been already having this conversation, but this is the first time that they have it publicly and we're very, ha very happy to host it. Um, uh, I will give you the floor, Andres, and then at the end of the talk, if there's any questions, I would, I would bring the questions of the audience to you. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Miguel. Uh, I'm very happy to be here in these cafes transatlanticos uh, that I'm so excited about. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here with Michael, which uh, in my opinion is one of the artists that are, are doing, uh, or understanding what's the, the role art can play in the kind of the contemporary state of the world and actually what, what is the capacity of art to both register and advance or kind of operate in the in a complex uh, 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 networks of entanglements that uh, uh, shape life now. And so for me, it's been very exciting, uh, very exciting to be, uh, to have this kind of long going conversation with Michael uh, uh, in the last years. Uh, and it's a conversation that actually probably started in the distance uh, when I saw your show at, for instance, at Prada Foundation, uh, which I, I really, it, really track of kind of, it was uh, capturing not my attention, but beyond that, like really kind of a sense of uh, uh, shaking what we collectively could imagine nature was about and being seen that reframed uh, in a kind of very clever way. But then of course we, we had many other conversations afterwards in person, uh, in different events to curatorial opportunities uh, at Columbia University uh, and in other places. So I, I think that it's, I, I really enjoy these kind of long going conversations because there's an opportunity for a kind of an evolution in the way everyone thinks and also. So maybe I would propose to start with, uh, I, I'd like to maybe Michael start uh, with a question about a work in particular that I remember I saw in New York, which is World Trade. Uh, and it's a work that uh, was in New York and let's say within New York, but beyond that, uh, it's a work that somehow was very much paying attention to a, a very specific thing, uh, the kind of still, which is seen as very abstract, as a kind of provision that could be somehow decontextualize as a material and that we architects work with just as a prescription in a way without asking where it comes from. But then it was totally rooted in the city of New York in an extraordinary way. And then it was also questioning what a city is now when you saw that it was part of circulations that were sort of questioning the confinement, the possibility of confining the urban so I'd like to unpack a little bit this work because I think it contains many of the nuances your work has been exploring. And I also think that it resounds of many of my search and, and, and interest. So, so maybe we could start here, Michael, if you want. Yeah, yeah. And I think what's interesting about this work is it is somehow at the intersection, many intersections, but at the intersection also of art and architecture. Um, mm -hmm. And you're working as an architect and I'm working as an artist, but we have many kind of overlapping and overlaid concerns. Maybe I should just very briefly describe this work you're talking about. Um, it's, it's actually a series of works, all, all part of a series called World Trade. Um, 
this is a work that deals with the, the World Trade Center um, and the, the destruction of those buildings and the attacks of September 11th in 2001. Um, it's a very, uh, was a very difficult work for me to make in many ways. Um, the, those attacks happened just after I had moved to New York for the very first time um, and left a kind of indelible impression. And not, not, only, not only that, I think that very much we, are, we continue to kind of live in the aftermath of that event, especially in the United States, um, in the kind of reverberations of, of that event. And so in trying to make a work that, that confronted um, that event and, and specifically those, those buildings, which became this kind of the subject matter, but also kind of the media for the work, um, I was sort of up against that kind of the kind of incredible kind of geopolitical force and the kind of the kind of intimacy of all of the kind of many, many stories of loss that are kind of wrapped up in, in that event, which made it kind of very, very overwhelming in a way to kind of figure out um, a way to begin to respond to this event as an artist. Um, and so the way I kind of found in is I've often focused on the kind of materiality of an artwork. Um, and through kind of a long period of sort of almost a very kind of um, latent kind of um, background period of research, um, I learned that the majority of the steel from the World Trade Towers was very quickly sent abroad to be recycled mm -hmm. um, in, in 2000, at the end of 2001, the beginning of 2002. Um, and so I began research trying to understand what happened to that steel, sort of what happened to the kind of material remains um, of the World Trade Towers. Um, and I found that much of it had been sent to be recycled um, to become kind of new products, um, especially in Asia, um, but because of the, the, kind of, uh, the kind of market demands at that time that, that there was a lot of construction happening in Asia and that's sort of where the steel kind of ended up. So ultimately I was able to trace a few different pathways that the steel took. Um, it was a large um, percentage was sold to um, a steel, a major steel company in Shanghai called Dao Steel. Um, also was sold to as a company in Malaysia called Mega Steel. And then, and this is a bit of a stranger story. I also found um, evidence that some of the steel was sold domestically to uh, a steel manufacturer in the state of Georgia. Um, so I, I figured I kind of traced through a series of documents and, and records the kind of path that this deal took out of the city actually very quickly um, following um, September 11, 2001. And then I sort of had to figure out a way, that I had this idea that a kind of appropriate way to engage with this material um, and to try to create something like a kind of memorial that was appropriate to these buildings would, to, would be to bring a small percentage of that steel back to New York. Um, and so I registered as a steel importer and made contact with these companies in order to bring um, the kind of new products that this steel had been turned into back to New York. Um, and the work kind of consists then of bringing some of this material to, it was, it was shown in a gallery in Lower Manhattan um, to kind of bring this remainder back and kind of to, com kind of to complete this circle in a way, but also to kind of trace the many, many people, the many kind of hands that this material touched and the sort of path that it took. Um, and I think there is some aspect of this work of thinking about these buildings as sort of monuments to world trade and use kind of using those circuit of world trade as the very kind of tool to create this gesture. Um, and so it's, um, it's a piece that's about materiality for sure, but obviously about the almost the limits of materiality as well. That this, the material when you see it, it looks completely anonymous. It's been turned into classical sheets for the most part, um, ready to be made into new products. Mostly, it was sort of slated to be used in, in automobiles and and um, home appliances, and most of it surely was. Um, and so it takes this very kind of anonymous form, and it's only through. Mm -hmm the accompanying document that you can kind of understand the history of this material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in a way, I, I think that there's something very uh, powerful also about this work, which has to do with the way it was presented. Uh, when uh, I remember 
uh, for instance, in New York, when it was presented in the, the space of the gallery, it was very much like, uh, uh, we kind of, there, there was a, it, it, there, there was kind of a connection with the tradition of minimalism. Uh, you could think, for instance, of the kind of, uh, uh, of the, kind of the, the sphere of uh, Calandre, for instance, uh, work or, uh, but in a way, uh, minimalism was claiming for this kind of uh, uh, disconnection with context, kind of autonomy. And, uh, and that is something that this work has not at all like, but, but, but at the same time it had it. So there was a tension rather than kind of a resolution. And I think there's something about the uh, way to operate politically in your work that somehow is avoiding the direct uh, kind of uh, appropriation of the politics of the spoken word to create other forms of material politics that are not that much kind of simplifying or resolving or kind of leading to a, a kind of depuration of the possible, but rather to kind of question it and make the tensions emerge, right? Yeah, I, th I mean, the Carl Andre reference is very important and very intentional. Um, and I think for me, Carl Andre is kind of this pinged point between <laughs> kind of high modernism and sort of what comes after. Um, and I think that the kind of the kind of legacy of modernism would be to kind of appropriate these forms of kind of mechanical reproduction, um, kind of industrial production, in which some material like steel, this very industrial material, can be elevated by art, but also it's understood as something that can be kind of replicable, repeatable. Um, it is therefore kind of anonymous as a material. It's it's purely kind of this um, abstract entity, this abstract kind of resource. Um, so I think I wanted to kind of critique that reading in a way by saying, actually, even this most seeming anonymous material can have a history um, and can be traced and isn't doesn't need to be anonymous, um, and, and which is kind of particularly interesting with steel because it's a material that is something like 99% recycled. It's almost like water. It continues to sort of cycle through um, different urban centers of the world. Um, and kind of as cities rise and, and kind of fall, they kind of, it kind of moves between um, all of these sort of like centers of building. Um, so to try to tra trace it is kind of, it, 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 it's, very, it's very difficult, um, but it's, it's a kind of a way of sort of re -under understanding the material in a new way. But on the other hand, I see the other kind of legacy of minimalism is one of kind of actually looking away from the artwork itself, um, the, yeah. the artwork as an object. Um, and whether that's sort of looking at the space in a new way and kind of incorporating that into the experience of the artwork, those are all kind of legacies of minimalism that for me kind of point away from the object work towards something else. Um, and I think that the way that for me, I think of the transport and of this deal by cargo ship and, and, and truck and all of these sort of um, the kind of, uh, kind of apparatus of logistics yeah. to me, that is a part of the work. And I think that to me, that's almost like taking a step beyond the kind of turning to the side that minimalism sort of suggested to the viewer or to the artist. Um, it kind of it kind of takes that even even further into this more kind of performative dimension. Yeah, in a way, uh, I don't know if you, if you think, for instance, of the entire discussion of trans uh, and queerness. Like, I, I think that it's something. I don't know. I, I I so for instance, when how important it was for Judith Butler to claim that gender was perform. You know, mm -hmm. but then perform was very much seen as. Uh, the opposite of being materially embodied. Hmm. Uh, you know, like gender not being embodied, but rather kind of performed. And then, uh, and then of course, Donna Haraway saying, uh, giving importance to the act, that, to the fact that it was bodied. And, and then Jack Halberstam with a radical kind of material approach to the construction of gender. And of course it's, it's uh, materially uh, built, but uh, it's built to uh, actually technology through uh, adjustments in our metabolisms and that so gender is a total construction, but it's also performed. So basically materiality, it's not the opposite of, or materially, uh, it's not really the opposite of um, perform. And then it, it comes to uh, a, a reflection on that save life for me and, and sort of life or kind of living beings and uh, how they are 
both constituted materially but also performing like it's it's a it's, it's a way to approach form and materiality that it's not kind of isolating it from the entanglements and from the kind of cycles it is part of and for me this this is kind of difficult it's been difficult in the last years to to kind of characterize this but i think this is happening and we see that uh, very much shaping many of the uh, let's say traditions of uh, uh, the, the, the discussion of technology. And uh, for me, it's also, you know, it's also a question about scale. What, what is the scale for materiality? What is the scale of objects uh, and how, I don't know, I have this, always this kind of focus in mind that if you look at things at a kind of very large scale, they are part of these kind of planetary circulations that you're talking about. If you look very close, you start seeing molecules and molecules are also moving and there's air in between them and there's, you know, like there's things are shaped by connections. And uh, so I wonder how constrained we are really by looking at objects uh, from this kind of tiny part of the spectrum where they exist and how part of our contemporary time is very much about moving uh, cross scales and looking what is an object uh, from a planetary scale, what is this at the kind of the scale where fungi operate, what it's, you know, what kind of associability happens in objects at all those different scales and how the object is actually operating uh, in that way, kind of also transitioning in a way, right? Yeah, I think the, just to go back a bit, the, you were talking about the sort of different conceptions of the kind of performance of gender identity, for example. And I think that um, that's very true. There were, that at a certain moment, there was almost this kind of rupture between what is embodied and what is sort of signified. Um, but I think that um, in a way, we're at a point where we see um, gender as something or, or, or many kinds of sort of embodied experience to be this kind of assemblage of like living bodies and signs and language um, all of these things become kind of entangled and because they're and also technologized um, in terms of how we kind of express who we are and communicate um, issues like identity. But I think it's true even beyond issues of identity. Um, when I think of performance art, and this is one version of performance art, um, one of the um, almost the kind of like ontological status of performance that I'm quite interested in is um, performance art that is both representational, but also embodied. Um, and to me, I'm, I almost make this distinction between performance art and theater, um, that if theater is more purely in the realm of the representational, performance art often like insists on the embodied presence of the performer. Um, and to me, that's a, that's, that's a kind of a very important way of thinking and the way I try to position a lot of my work, even if it doesn't have to do with human bodies. Um, and I think, for example, in the, the world trade work, the, the, the presence of the steel was just as important as a story of its origin. Um, those two things are somehow there together. They exist um, in relation to one another and they're of, this, of the same piece. Um, just as a, perf a, a performer um, embodies the gesture that they perform um, and are, they're, they're both uh, representing themselves and an action while really completing that action and really mm -hmm. being present. Um, so I think that's, and that's something that also might be able to extend beyond uh, either exceed the scale of the human body or kind of move into this kind of microscopic version that you're talking about. And I think what's also kind of very interesting to me about this, this sort of um, the sweeping kind of micro macro um, kind of transitions of scale that you're talking about is how often that's kind of necessarily enabled by technology. Um, that in order to see the large scale, in order to see the small scale, in order to kind of register those effects, you often need some kind of a, like visual or sensory assistance, if not something that you can see on your own, whether it's data sets that allow you to kind of trace the larger movement of things or, um, or like a microscope that allows you to see something very, very small. Yeah. Actually, it makes me think about this um, incredible film project that you've worked on recently that traces the kind of imagery uh, and kind of 
the imagistic ways of knowing um, the coronavirus. I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a work that is called the Transcolor Architecture of COVID-19 that I did with, with Ivan Manuera and that was actually looking at COVID as something that was really not a, like, I mean, what is a disease now, right? Like basically it's a, it's kind of a, uh, it's something that is not attacking human from outside and humans are healthy and then the, the virus comes. It's really growing from inside, like the, the effects of urbanism and directly entangled with the, with the possibility for a virus to move from one species to others. The, uh, we've seen that in Wuhan, of course, and, uh, and then it all grows as a uh, huge transformation that incorporates many different technologies and scales. And, and I, I think that is totally changing the way we think of architecture. I also have like a journey from minimalism to something different, full materiality, uh, in looking at the Barcelona Pavilion. When you look at the Barcelona Pavilion, you see basically this sort of self-referential kind of precious uh, architecture. But, but everything there was basically operating as part of larger systems. Actually, it's seen as very, for those that are not familiar with the Barcelona Pavilion, it's this kind of building that was a temporary participation of the, like the national German participation uh, in the international exhibition of Barcelona, 1929, and that then was uh, was destroyed soon after the exhibition was finished, and then it was reconstructed in the 1980s as part of kind of the rebranding of Barcelona and uh, presentation of Barcelona as a site that was connected to international uh, cultural trends. And uh, what for me is very interesting is that from the very beginning, in the first place, that was really catering to commercial. Uh, interest, uh, the incapacity or kind of the impossibility for Germany to sell their products uh, after the internationally after the uh, Versailles Treaty basically was leaving only the only possibility to sell products to the new Latin American economies of the cities that were growing at that time, like La Habana or uh, uh, Buenos Aires or Bogota that were hugely commission, huge commissioners uh, for building materials. And then they did this pavilion as a kind of showroom for marble uh, and glass and steel and things like that. So uh, it was actually very much of a commercial tool, but part of its success depended on the possibility of not being seen as a commercial tool. So if they put the sign, they're saying we're selling marbles here uh, from Germany, <laughs> that would not work. So they had to kind of make it something hidden, like a subliminal tool for uh, to advertise those uh, commercial capacities. But that's kind of, sub kind of this kind of hidden discourse or program ended up having a huge uh, power in architecture that was architects became experts in hiding the actual uh, programs of architecture and presenting them as if they were just so referential. And, and that, that for me, it's something that, I mean, that was very much rooted in the work that Dili Rai and had done uh, in the master or kind of course, master course, something like that in uh, commercial window design at the Deutsche Verbund. So it's, it was very, very intentional and uh, it came from Sobert's philosophical idea. So it's, it's quite it's easy to track all that, but it's uh, the knowledge of how it operated, it didn't kind of, allowed architects to understand what was it about. It was basically this kind of commercial tool that was hiding its commercial purpose to be successful. So it's very much uh, uh, Marshall McLuhan, like the message needs to be not perceived as a message to be, become environmentalized to, to be effective. And, and I think that is a big part of what uh, the tradition of modern materiality was about really in order for materiality to fully unfold and be imbricated and entangled with the making of the world, uh, it needed to be perceived as disentangled. And that, that for me is kind of a very kind of interesting cultural conflict that we're kind of unpacking now. And for yeah. me, it's really exciting, right? I think what's also so interesting about that project of yours is the, the analysis, right, of the basement and how the, it's almost like the, the basement is the kind of apparatus that maintains what is above ground mm -hmm. in, the, in the reconstruction. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that points to this idea of the, almost like the machinic kind of technological side of architecture, which you kind of 
in some version of modernity would be what's foregrounded is there hidden. Um, so it's actually what you don't what you don't see. Almost it kind of reminds me of like the way that like Walter Benjamin will talk about the the modern motion picture kind of being this elaborate construction that hides the camera itself, but the very apparatus of its construction is exactly what's hidden. Um, there's something similar about this basement. It's almost like it's almost like the camera that then projects the yeah. pavilion above. Yeah, it's it's quite funny because I remember the first time I discovered that there was a basement. It was like obvious for everyone that there was a basement, but no one mentioned it. Uh, it was right there. There was kind of a tiny door that would allow you to go there, but no one really considered that important whatsoever. So it was really kind of hidden, even in their minds of those that were working at the pavilion, that they they understood it as totally detached from the actual pavilion, let's say. So it's funny because the basement was, as you said, was like what produced the, the image, what edited. What is interesting is that there was this cut. For me, that, that is fascinating. Like there's this cut that was taken there because they wanted to make sure that in the midst kind of in the part that is visited by uh, visitors, uh, like Miss Nowhere's, I would call them basically, that they had seen for years this uh, pavilion in photographs in expensive books, and then they wanted to visit it. And basically to confirm what they've seen. Uh, the kind of interesting thing is that uh, that requires so much construction. So one part of that is that the, the, the pavilion should not have animals in it. And it was very open, so it was very easy for mice to get in. Mm. Uh, and then they brought this cat. But this cat is a little bit like your animals from extinction, ex extinct in the wild, which is basically it's an animal that came uh, to find its habitat in this kind of complex system of two story building with the basement that was edited in the upper part. To the extent that because she, I mean, again, like she was part of the camera, so she could not be seen by the visitors to the pavilion. And then uh, she was hidden in the basement. And because she was in the dark of the basement all day long, she developed uh, a macular atrophia. So at the end, she could not really see anything. So she was taken to the kind of upper floor to hunt mice, and she could not see the marble or the onyx or the whatever expensive materials. She could only kind of navigate that to sound, to smell, to kind of. So uh, what is interesting for me is that she was physically saved by the project of doing uh, this, editing this pavilion. Mm -hmm. so, so it's it's really kind of a cultural project like that, saved through circulation in kind of a tiny space of two story, a two story building was actually not, uh, not detached from this being, like this this kind of being was part of the design, was part of its materiality, right? And this brings me also to your work on basically the entanglement of life with technology and technology understood here, not as an Apple iPhone, but kind of the development of kind of constructed devices, systems, and life directly part of that shaped and shaping those realities uh, and being entangled with it, right? Like that's been a huge part of your work. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, yeah, and I think that's an interesting story of sort of the biological kind of re-entering into uh, your analysis of the, of the architecture of the pavilion. And also kind of so ironic that um, a pavilion so defined by glass and by transparency <laughs> would be the same building that kind of produces the kind of darkness that became uh, that kind of triggered the development of this disease and this cat. It's kind of, there's like a, a strange kind of irony there. Um, but yeah, I think uh, for sure, I think in my conception of technology, the idea of biotechnology, or in kind of like the broadest sense is incredibly important. Um, and I think that um, I don't just mean that in terms of what we like might consider kind of biotech uh, in terms of an industry, but I, I mean the kind of intersection of all the ways, uh, all kinds of technological productions and kind of living material and living living beings, um, whether human or non-human, is, is a kind of an incredibly important theme that I explore in, in many different ways and many different projects. Maybe why don't you, uh, I mean, this kind of uh, Zoom media 
requires probably explanation. So maybe why don't you explain one of these projects? Maybe yeah, sure. I, I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll describe the one that you that you saw at the at the Prada Foundation, um, yeah. and this is very much a kind of one iteration of an ongoing project. Um, it's the larger project is called Extinct in the Wild. Um, and I'm really kind of narrowly focused here on a category of species that is considered extinct in nature, but still persists under human care, uh, persists in captivity um, or in cultivation. Um, so it could be things that are only found in botanic gardens. It could be uh, species that are only kept as pets and aren't found in, in the wild, but there are sort of many, it's almost like you can catalog the whole kind of um, the kind of many different relationships between humans and non-humans um, mm -hmm. kind of for, form the, the stories behind each of these species, whether it's something, just to name a few of these species, there's the um, axolotl is um, this amphibian that lived in the canals of Lake Xochimilco. It was its only habitat. It's almost no longer found there, but that habitat was, it's kind of already an artificial habitat. It's not purely natural. They're the, the Aztec canals of Mexico City. Um, and it's, it's only habitat to this day. Um, what's interesting in that particular species story is how the axolotl is now this sort of global species. It's used as a kind of map model organism in laboratories. So there are tens of thousands of these axolotls that are being bred around the world, even mm -hmm. as it sort of is no longer really found in the place where it evolved um, in, in Lake Xochimilco. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the kind of stories that, I, that I'm engaging with. And what I've done is um, I've created these exhibitions in which the kind of these spaces for art are transformed into these kinds of life support systems for these species. Um, and I think at a kind of more kind of conceptual level, to me, what's interesting about these extinct in the wild species is how you can't consider them natural anymore in a way they are themselves products of, of culture now because they only exist in horticulture or yeah. agriculture or these different spheres of culture. Um, so they, I was very much thinking through the history of the ready-made uh, what does it mean to bring something from mass culture into high culture into an art space? These sort of living the entire kind of species, in fact, to me, were now cultural entities that could be like the ready-made ready brought into spaces of art and kind of appreciated as kind of aesthetic beings. Um, so these, these exhibitions are um, kind of extend in a way the kind of curatorial care afforded artworks um, with kind of cura really coming, curation coming from cura with the Latin root meaning to give care, um, to care, um, to extend that to these lineages of species that now only exist in these sort of networks um, of kind of human offered care. I mean, I'm always fascinated with the, the details of these projects. Uh, and the details of how life can be, for instance, taken to a place like the Prada Foundation uh, yeah. and how that is exhibited because in the details and the conflicts of that, there's so much to learn. Yeah. I'd like to know, I mean, maybe this is something that we never talk about, but how difficult it's been for you to bring living animals to a kind of exhibition space, for instance. It's very, very tricky. Um, and I, in fact, I rarely have um, because I think for me, the, it's much easier to establish the right um, conditions to bring a plant, for example, into an art space than it is to bring an animal. Um, uh, there, it's, it's partly a kind of an ethical question, um, but it's also um, the, the kind of need for very specialized care. Um, one of the few times I did this was in this exhibition at the Potter Foundation, and I, was, I brought two species, um, something called the red-tailed black shark, um, and the axolotl, and they're both aquatic species. I was kind of very, it was very fortuitous in a way that at Prada they had just exhibited this kind of major Damien Hirst piece full of fish, full of cichlids. And so they had a relationship with um, a kind of aquarium expert. Um, and so in a way, the kind of expansion of the media of this contemporary art foundation already included the care of aquatic species. So I worked with the same person um, then to care for the axolotl and the, the species of fish that were a part of the exhibition. Um, and I think it, it was kind of quite perfect in my way of thinking about how 
um, our institutions are evolving. I think one of the, one of the many seeds of this project was a kind of fantasy I had of thinking about like a conservation department of like a major museum, how as media has kind of really expanded, whether it's, um, you know, VHS, the preservation of like VHS tapes, um, or it's uh, artworks that involve um, kind of food or other kinds of, all kinds of materials that it's no longer just caring for a canvas or a panel where people have developed kind of techniques for doing that over hundreds of years. Suddenly conservators need to conserve these like kind of new novel um, kinds of materials and have to become much more, uh, have to develop much kind of broader range of expertise. I had this sort of fantasy, what if in this work, Extinct in the Wild, it were acquired by a major museum and they're now tasked with maintaining the lineage of a rare species. Yeah. Uh, kind of merging two forms of conservation in one. So that was sort of, sort of the fantasy at, at the mm -hmm. origin of this. And suddenly when I was working with the Prada Foundation's kind of aquarium expert, it was almost like that fantasy was kind of nearing some kind of realization. It's very funny because the, the work that you were referring to before, the, the, that, that I called uh, Phantom Misas Render Society, which is really this installation about the Bartram Pavilion by Miss Van der Rohe and Lily Reich, was acquired, I think, a couple of years ago by the Art Institute of Chicago. And then there was a moment that was really funny in a way, complex and, and interesting for me uh, when they uh, in order to, and it's, it's part, I mean, those that are in Chicago can go and see it. It's in the uh, part of the permanent exhibition. And uh, it's kind of a large uh, installation with pieces of marble experiments uh, uh, that they did with the, with the water lilies uh, that they've been collecting the objects and many, many other things. So the funny thing is that these things one of the things why they were so important is that they were part of this ecosystem, like the moss growing in them, the, the kind of all these microbes in them were crucial uh, and was, were crucial because there were many stories that could only be explained if we look at the details of this uh, kind of microscopical life. For instance, the, the travertine breaks because there's particular funds, kinds of fungi that grow in the, in the holes, in the tiny holes. They have to be extracted with a vacuum cleaner every single day. So there's two people that are hired only to do that because the, basically the, the travertine cannot be seen like dirty uh, uh, with plants in it or, or breaking. So, uh, so when it was acquired by the, uh, by the Art Institute of Chicago, the conservers, the kind of the, the people working on conservation, basically they, they had to figure out how to deal with this? Because basically they were objects that were part of larger ecosystems and they were part of kind of ecosystem, living ecosystems. But of course, if you bring moss into the galleries, uh, that could affect the Picassos and the Juan Gris. And of course, that's something that they don't want to do. So it's kind of, uh, it was very, it was a huge discussion that took almost a year how to deal with them in a way we ended up with a solution is that they would freeze all the elements. So they would take them to a super low temperature that would make it very difficult to them for them to kind of evolve, to grow to, but they had some sort of latent uh, life that if placed again in the pavilion, they would be able to uh, develop life again, which was kind of very complicated and scientifically loaded discussion that could only be addressed to the expert knowledge of those uh, people working on conservation. For me, that was fascinating. And that involved putting all the pieces in huge freezers that could reduce the temperature. I don't remember, but it was kind of 200 uh, degrees centigrade below zero and something like that. So really, really low temperature to, to paralyze any possibility of living in, of life in the galleries. So I, I think that you, you're totally right. Maybe we're looking, we're paying too much attention to the traditions of curatorial work in order to understand the discourse of museums. But in my, in my opinion, I would totally agree with you that from the perspective that you're talking about and that I also are interested on, uh, probably it's the other part, it's the parts that have to do with conservations, the what that are shaping culturally the discourse of contemporary museums, right? And the, you, the story you're telling, which is so fascinating, actually reminds me of almost um, a kind of parallel, but maybe inverse story um, from the world of um, biological conservation, 
Yeah. Uh, so one of the species I've looked into its story that, that was at one time considered extinct in the wild is the California condor. Um, <laughs> so in the late 1980s, the sort of last remaining condor, California condors, were captured to be taken into a captive breeding program. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that was a moment when suddenly this species no longer existed in nature, and they only existed now in, in these conservation programs. When they did that, they, um, and I think following kind of a similar logic to the conservation practices that you're describing, they um, kind of killed all the lice on these mm. condors, um, kind of to sanitize them before they were kind of brought into this program. Not at that time, but at some point later, it was realized that there was a very specific species of lice that only was, was parasitic only on California condors. Mm. Um, and so when they did that, they caused the extinction of this species of, yeah. of lice. Um, so it was almost this kind of trading one species for another. It may, you know, that wasn't nece necessary in the end. It probably, it, the condor had kind of lived alongside these lice for, for thousands of years. But there was this kind of moment of uh, kind of drawing a line around one species, kind of isolating it for this uh, conservation program that then caused the extermination of this entire other species that was really overlooked um, because it was a, 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 an insect. Um, but I, I kind of wish that they had used the same careful techniques that your <laughs> conservators did to kind of maintain the kind of biological complexity and richness um, of those works, and that's, that same the same techniques could have been applied to the condor. In, in a way, that's happening with uh, in, in your work for Palermo, the Drowned World, uh, where you produce these carboniferous forest. That correct me if I'm wrong, but I would explain it like basically the type of forest that was producing the uh, the reserves of uh, oil and kind of uh, and coal and all these uh, kind of fossil resources or kind of uh, fossil realities that are that were mobilized as resources through industrialization and that then were which industrialization could be explained basically as the release of those fossil um, uh, minerals uh, uh, to the atmosphere right and and then how that was uh, removing the ocean and was allowing for the sun to to kind of or, or they, that created created again the conditions for those carboniferous forests to proliferate around the world. What what I I found fascinating. I mean, there's so much to unpack in this work. It has to do with this kind of trading of species that you were referring to. This kind of interrelation, kind of mutually dependency of different species, like the limits of one very much affect the limits of the other. The extension of one depends on the kind of constraint of the other. And, uh, but also has to do with something that in my opinion was very beautiful to see that there, which is really how humans can be removed from this equation. Mm -hmm. We can see the extinction of humanity, not at the end of the planet, but as part of the evolution of it. And in the range of industrialization and kind of humanity, there's forests that will be growing, right? Yeah, I mean, I think this is the temporal dimension to the kind of question of scale you were talking about earlier. But uh, I think earlier we were talking about that spatially. Um, this work, because it sort of attempts to span a 300 million year cycle, is sort of looking at deep time. Uh, and what does it mean to make an artwork that kind of engages with that kind of expanse of time. Um, and so, yeah, just to, as you kind of described, this work was a kind of recreation of a carboniferous forest, um, the kinds of forests that 300 million years ago formed the bulk of the Earth's coal reserves. So to me, this is sort of the organic origins of industrialization, um, but the kind of unseen origins because these forests haven't existed for 300 million years. So in my kind of envisioning, as we burn these forests, we're actually restoring those, th this ancient atmosphere, um, the forests that had be kind of grown up out of that atmosphere and then had been entombed in the earth as we burned them, we're kind of creating that, the atmosphere of a carboniferous period all over again. Yeah. Maybe that creates the conditions then in which these forests can emerge. So this is sort of in, in the kind of science fiction version of the work, it's almost like the first return of the carboniferous forest that the process that now can continue. And what was very interesting is that um, we were able to install this forest within the ruins of a, of a coal gas plant. Mm -hmm. So it's a very kind of site where this 
where coal was kind of technologically vaporized. Um, so kind of trying to draw this connection between ancient atmospheres and the atmosphere of today. Um, and yes, and also the kind of biological life that's supported by and creates those, those atmospheres. Um, but when you look at 300 million years, that's vastly beyond any kind of human timescale. Um, and so to think about the kind of role of kind of being an artist, um, the, the role of a kind of a viewer in confronting that time scale, it's kind of minuscule. It's sort of this tiny, tiny kind of component of, um, of a work that's trying to kind of tap into um, these ancient kind of lineages and, and histories and kind of geochemical histories. Um, and so I think for me, I sometimes do think about artworks that are not just for human viewers um, that kind of create an effect, but that that, that effect could potentially, even if it's a very, very, very small effect, could, could potentially kind of continue beyond even the existence of the human species. Um, but it's almost the kind of question of like a tree falling in a forest, um, you know, with, with no one around. It's like, is it, is it still an artwork? I, I don't know what it is, but I, I think I'm very interested in those effects that might kind of still play out even without the kind of existence of, of a human hand or, or, or a human viewer. How, how do you feel about extinction? Because for me, it's kind of a fundamental uh, question of our times. As an architect, I am expected often to give solutions for it. You know, like, and there's this, of course, this movement of extinction rebellion that I, I think is so important. And at the same time, I feel that personally, we're all uh, probably, I mean, I, I, I definitely believe that I'm committed to uh, basically do as much as possible to, to, to respond to climate crisis and also not as something of the future, but the, the kind of uh, inequality that is producing. At the same time, uh, what is the fear for humans to extinguish? You know what I mean? Like it's maybe we uh, we need to extinguish and that's not really a drama. Maybe it's more a question, of, you know, like it's, it's there's a moral tension here, a political question about what is the way that we deal with this situation? What is the, what is the exact reason why uh, the extinction of the human is so, uh, let's say problematic uh, or why not, why, uh, what is the way that we deal with the extinctions of other beings? I think this is a question that needs, that is, I mean, apparently it's very easy to respond, but if you put it in the context, for instance, of in, uh, the discussion, the political discussions of interspecies relationships, the kind of uh, the idea of the exceptionality of the human is being very much built on the possibility of, for humans to decide what is sacrificable, sacrificable mm -hmm. what, what could be sacrificed, yep. right? Like animals could be sacrificed, plants could be sacrificed, forests could be sacrificed. So if, put it, if we put it in context, there is a moment in which a big part of the question is what is the status of other beings? And what is the way that we construct not a discourse about humans not extinguishing, but uh, kind of an interspecies alliance that stabilizes a relationship kind of produces a durable relationship because uh, the very notion of the human exceptionality is in itself what is producing the extinction of the humans, right? In a way, so I, I think this is a kind of crucial question and somehow your work is activating it. I think that we, we share this kind of operating in this kind of gray zone that is conceptually, politically, formally, uh, aesthetically very complex and that where there's not that easy way to go through shortcuts, short, shortcuts right? Yeah, yeah. I think I mean it's very, very complicated. I think um, like the science tells us we are in an, uh, in a mass extinction, um, just yeah. numbers, um, and so this is a kind of uh, a kind of rare catastrophe. Um, and it is also very clear that somehow taken in its totality, the human species and, and primarily the kind of industrial um, capitalist humans uh, who kind of make up the human species are, are largely responsible for these many, many extinctions. Um, so there is a kind of ethical question there, but at the same time, I think the idea even of a species, it's sort of rooted very much in uh, kind of early modern science. And I think it's also something that's been very much being questioned now, sort of what even, what even is a species, especially when you understand that you know, so many organisms are really assemblages of, of many, many kinds of organisms. 
Um, and an ecosystem also is an assembly to many kinds of organisms. Um, and, you know, having a few representatives of many species in zoos or gardens is one thing, but then to kind of lose the kind of richness of the kind of, um, the kind of ecosystem life that, um, that you know, mm -hmm. you, by isolating these species you might you would lose is another kind of loss. So I think we're kind of grappling with all of these, almost weighing the scale the sort of, as you're saying, what, what can be sacrificed, but it's, it's a very, very, very difficult question. And it's also knowing individuals in the position to make those decisions really kind of individually as well. They're so kind of these sort of ways of living and other species ways of living are so kind of like minutely entangled with our own and all kinds of other kind of global effects. And it's, it's very difficult to kind of design um, a kind of, uh, kind of singular solutions for all of these issues. Yeah. In, in a way, I have the feeling that it, it's, we're facing the need to reconsider the status of the human as and kind of questioning the possibility of the human to be individual, to be sipped up uh, beings. In the same way that you were working with the steel, looking at the steel as something that was entangled in large systems and ecosystems, uh, I have the feeling that there's no possibility of being an isolated human. Like the, the neoliberal dream of the individual is very much questioned when we see how dependent we are from others. And basically uh, that means that probably we are neglecting parts of ourselves yeah. within how we expand into humans, into, into forests, like how much we depend on the Amazonia, our lands are really the Amazonia or the ocean. And we're at the same time neglecting that. So somehow even catering to the human, uh, it's, it's very much questioning the way humans are, have been uh, neglecting fellow humans and others uh, in this kind of uh, uh, period of modernity. And, and that's probably what probably is happening now. Yeah, like yeah. recognizing our interspecies selves is sort of the beginning to understanding those entanglements. We have two questions here that maybe we can address. One is by Kevin Brown that is saying, uh, how has the pandemic affected your work and your view of things? Maybe you want to go for that. Yeah, I mean, in so many ways. Um, and I think in, I think my, my kind of initial response, um, maybe just even to continue the conversation we we're just having is how much it kind of underscores this kind of, the myriad kind of global and interspecies entanglements that are a part of contemporary life in particular, um, the kind of life under, various forms of globalism. Um, what does it mean to link bats <laughs> and microbes and, um, and, and humans across you know, all continents? Um, that to me almost, it's almost a kind of underscored what, um, yeah, the kind of world that, that, that I exist in and that my, that my work exists in. Um, in terms of the, the kind of very concretely that the, the way I work, this is something that Andres and I are both dealing with right now, is I was, uh, the kind of global art world that I existed in relied on kind of carbon guzzling travel and, and, and all these sorts of things that suddenly it's much more and it's been slowed down to, to, to an extreme degree. And that changes the way that, that I work. Um, and I'm still figuring out the best way to do that. Um, I think we're both kind of figuring this out right now, like how like how much can work happen remotely, especially work that often, a lot of my work is site specific. Um, so all that is changing and I'm still very much kind of grappling with understanding that. And I've started to do more work that um, is um, almost returned to more mobile media. Um, um, I, I recently made a video because it was something that I could kind of disseminate more easily than a lot of the, the, the kind of more kind of material physical work that I, that I create, um, but I, I'm still figuring it out. In a way, I think that there's, I mean, because it's true that we're struggling with this. And for, for instance, I'm curating the, the Shanghai uh, Biennale that Miguel was mentioning before. And uh, I mean, I, I'll travel hopefully to China now, but I, I haven't done it since February. And uh, this means that basically there's two ways of doing this. One is really kind of becoming a little bit of a, uh, I mean, being supported by inequality, I would put it this way. Like basically 
uh, forcing things to be happening at a distance uh, with a huge mobilization of the work of others and somehow uh, outsourcing the, the risk of operating in a pandemic uh, by kind of uh, developing structures of power for that. I mean, we, we, we do that at a kind of tiny level, right? Like we see in cities how the, a big part of the risk is being allocated in people that move things around. People that uh, deliver food or that uh, take care of kids and therefore they are the ones that are kind of moving from one house to the other. You know, like it's uh, at the same time that a big part of the population is getting confined. I think this, this is kind of a, not an accident. I, I think that it was very important down to earth, the, the work that Bruno Latour uh, wrote, I think three, four years ago, that was announcing this kind of climate regime in which uh, he would say that basically climate crisis cannot be detached from the race of neoliberalism. That basically the idea that the cost of life could be imposed on others, the environmental, the financial, uh, it's been kind of basically what has been behind the, the, the climate crisis that we're, we're going through now. And therefore that was precisely what needed to be changed. The possibility of basically living out of our own resources, let's say with what could be the load that could be taken by our own ecosystems. And I think that's a crucial, uh, uh, conflict of our times that has been very much uh, put in place through COVID. Many people thought that COVID was providing a, an alternative to, to uh, climate crisis, that basically it was resolving them, that pollution was disappearing, that it was stopping emissions, but actually it did not. All that came with uh, COVID was sort of ex kind of taking further what the kind of inequality, environmental inequality that we've seen that took us to climate crisis. So I think this, this is a fundamental question because I think it's a moment like Kevin Brown's question. It's a moment in which we have to decide. And when it came, for instance, to the Shanghai Biennale, I think that is what I would like to, to think that is happening is more like the development of uh, structures of trust and mutual care and, and that is what I think that could change things. If we carefully look at the animals that are placed in the gallery, if we carefully imagine what is the way that others, in, we interact with others, that's probably the most radical change that we can do and kind of avoiding offshoring the cost of any activity to others. I mean, this is a very general idea, but I, if you think for instance of New York, uh, that each day is, the air is cleaner but it's because the NOx of New York is being taken to Susquehanna Valley, uh, through very all the, the the trust, the kind of what you put in the trust, being, it's taken to Kentucky. So basically, New York is clean because the 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 kind of the waste of New York is evacuated to many different technologies elsewhere. And I think this is the fundamental uh, conflict that we're facing now. Right, take it away. We have another question from Inigo Villafranca, I think. Following this, perhaps the response to problems such as anthropogenic climate change should be equally anthropogenic, artificial. This could imply intervening directly on planetary processes to technology, synthetic bio answers to geoengineering. Do you feel that art can come up with ideas or offer new terraformist fictions? I'm happy to, to answer that. And, and I think I would say yes. Um, but I, I also might, might temper that yes a little bit and say that um, there, first of all, I think that art in sort of its most ancient sense is technology, um, that these two things are bound up together. Um, and so the kind of artifice of geoengineering is a, is a kind of art making at a global scale. Um, but, but I think that, I think you're um, talking about art in sort of it's more kind of rarefied, sort of more kind of like representational mode. Um, and there too, I think that um, art can kind of envision other possibilities for sure, but it also can kind of prepare um, people for other ways of thinking. Um, and so I think that there are, there's so many modes of kind of imagining um, the future um, and the, some of the kind of maybe crudest 
um, kind of mechanistic answers uh, to climate change um, that uh, kind of focus on geoengineering solutions are, are quite singular. Um, and I'm not speaking for all of the work being done, but there are some versions that are looking for almost kind of simple fixes, um, say a particular kind of carbon sequestration, say um, uh, different kinds of uh, kind of um, um, seeding clouds and kind of creating kind of new atmospheric effects. Um, but I feel like that, that different modes of sort of artistic practice could suggest uh, maybe the, the way Andres is talking about working across multiple scales, looking at the sort of need to, to conserve um, heterogeneity and entanglements that, that might um, kind of allow us to think in a much more kind of nuanced and kind of careful way about the different kinds of solutions that, that could be helpful. And, and my guess is it won't be uh, something so singular, um, one technological advance, say, but it will involve all kinds of um, kind of new ways of living, um, new ways of producing and consuming um, alongside other kinds of technology for the creation of energy. Thank you. Thanks. I think we we have reached four o'clock. I, 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 I mean, we could keep talking because uh, we keep listening in my case because I, it was wonderful conversation, both of you. And uh, we thank you for that. Uh, hope to have the next one in person. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's been really, really interesting to listen to both you both. And uh, thank you. And uh, we'll keep in touch and maybe we could do some, some many, uh, any other things uh, together. We'll tell you about our next uh, events. And uh, thank you for all the audience. Um, we'll have our next coffee in the next month in March. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Andres. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. Bye.